He wants to talk to you about uh, his experiences during that time, and in particular about the Bataan Death March, which is what the mass movem movement of American prisoners came to be known as from the time of their surrender in 1942, 65 miles north to the POW camps where the Japanese marched them. So uh, I know you're looking forward to hearing his presentation, and so am I. Thank you, Dr. Dunn. Dun, Dun. uh, Jim, I don't have enough to go around, but you can pass out what I have here. Okay. I was just looking at that skeleton back there on the, in the case. I used to look like that, just had some skin stretched over. I weighed 96 pounds when, when this uh, war was over, over in the Pacific. But I was captured in the Philippine Islands. All of you know where the Philippine Islands are, I'm sure. Uh, in the South Pacific, approximately 8,000 miles from Goche. And uh, I was in the Army Air Corps. I was a flight engineer, and the, we went to the Philippines without any aircraft. There were six squadrons in my group. And when we got to the Philippines without the airplanes, and the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, General MacArthur, the Supreme Commander in the Far East, he redesignated my group, 27th Bombardment Group, the 27th Provisional Infantry Battalion sent us to the front lines and the jungles of Bataan. Of course, it's all new. I'm a, I'm a country boy. I was when I was talked into the Army Air Corps. Uh, I'll never forget a little second lieutenant by the name of Evans. He talked me into the Air Corps. I was flying. I was taking flying lessons at Brooklyn, what is, uh, used to be the uh, airport there, civilian airport in Mobile. But anyway, we arrived in the Philippines without any aircraft. We went to Manila, of course, that's where we uh, dis disembarked from the ship. Took us out to a Philippine Army uh, camp. And uh, we were there for two weeks in tents on the parade ground when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. And we said, well, from what we had heard of Japanese, well, they're bow-legged, crooked, couldn't see. And we said, well, it'll take just about six weeks and we'll clean them up. Well, you know how long it lasted. And they could see good. They were good fighters. Uh, depending on what main island in Japan they came from, depending on the size of them. Hokkaido, the northern uh, island of Japan, they've got big men up there. They've got beards, and uh, they're strong. Well, those, uh, those people kind of were superior over all the other Japanese from the other islands. And uh, it always amused me that when one of these Japanese was t trying to tell another one something, they'd jabber back and forth. And I'm standing off the side, and I know what's this guy trying to communicate to the other one. So I'd, I'd ask him to come on the side, you know, and I'd step in there and tell this one what this one's trying to tell him. Well, they'd thank me. But they had a problem with communication. The uh, Thanksgiving Day is when we arrived in the Philippines, 1941. Went out to this camp, the Japanese attacked, and I was in the tent and uh, about 9 o'clock at night, and the siren sounded warning us that there was an air attack. So we took off. We'd been told where to go for safety. It's a ravine right off this uh, parade ground. So we went to this parade ground. We were smoking cigarettes and going along. You know, we go to that climb down in this ravine, sit there about 20 minutes, and the all clear sounded. We went back to our tents. And they had told us not to pull our clothes off because uh, of air attacks. Well, it was, you know how hot it is in the Philippines, the tropics. And so we got back to our tents. There was eight men in the tent. 
we pulled off our clothes right down to our shorts and went to bed. Well, when I woke up, it seemed like that bed was turning end to end, you know, and there's machine guns rattling. I looked out the flap of the tent and there's tracers going in all directions. I heard airplanes diving, pulling out. I heard bombs exploding. And I looked around, I was the only one in the tent. So I grabbed my shoes, boots on, and took off. Well, I realized that I had them on the wrong feet to start with. But I couldn't take time enough to stop and switch. So I had a hard job getting to that ravine. Well, I didn't make it to the ravine. Because I heard an airplane diving, and his machine guns was rattling. And there was a small ditch just before you get to the road that runs around the parade ground, row of trees all the way around, and it had a small ditch about a foot and a half, two feet wide, about eight, ten inches deep. So, boy, I dove in that, that ditch there. But that airplane wasn't shooting at me. They wasn't shooting at any of us there. Uh, they were after a radio station off the base. And, of course, Nichols Field, which was right be across from uh, Fort McKinley. Uh, when it all clear sounded, we began going, going back to our quarters, and it was, it was a lot of confusion. We had a, a mess sergeant. We heard somebody hollering for help. And we used to have old heavy tugs, they called them, uh, machines that would pull airplanes around with it real heavy. And this guy was <laughs> under there. He done got jammed under this tug, and he couldn't get out. So we had to pick that tug up off of him to get him out. He, incidentally, he was our mess sergeant. And uh, we had a couple of people that were wounded. And uh, they were wounded because you cross this road off the parade ground, there's a row of cottages, and, and between these cottages were clotheslines. And these guys hit those clotheslines and they'd flip them. And there's was, was more wounded there than the Japs wounded that night. Well, we were moved on Christmas Eve from Fort McKinley to Bataan, which is the southern province of uh, Luzon Island. Now, Bataan is a peninsula which is, sticks down into the China, South China Sea and then comes into Manila Bay and it makes a big swirl in about 30 miles across. And Manila sits over on the far side. So we went to Bataan, down in that peninsula. And uh, they issued us a 30 caliber rifle, bolt action, issued us 90 rounds of ammunition, and a box of hardtack, and a can of corned beef. And they proceeded to put us in a bivouac about five miles south of the main line. Well, this is where we had infantry training. Now, in my, we were all Air Corps people, radio operators, engineers, the mechanics, uh, whatever. So they sent an infantry sergeant over out of the 31st Infantry, and he gave us a half an hour of rifle and bayonet drill. He showed us how to hold a rifle. He showed us how to use it in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And uh, then he had us fire at target. And he, the bullets were in little clips. There were five bullets to a clip. And uh, this is 1918, 1916 ammunition. You may fire the first round, but then the next round wouldn't fire. So you have to eject it, put another shot, in, another shell in, try to fire it. If it fired, fine. If not, you had to pull, uh, pull it out and put another one in. Usually it's around two to three duds in each one of those clips. So that, that uh, wasn't too secure especially when you got into battle. Of course, I never did have to use my rifle in battle. I had a machine gun, 30 caliber machine gun, water cooled, and uh, you might find it had a round cylinder on top of the machine gun. And uh, the, sh the bullets were put in there like this. And as you fired it, it'd, it'd kick around to the next one. It'd go, thump, thump. 
But then third time, it jam. So you'd have to try to unjam it. Well, you've got Japanese coming across. Well, it just so happened we had machine guns set up all across the front lines. And as these Japanese were coming across the rice paddy, hitting our barbed wire entanglement, which we had about 75 feet out in front of our line, these guys down here were doing the shooting here. We were shooting in this direction. That's what they call crossfire. And we had it all raked across there. And uh, we were up there for 99 days on the front. We ran out of food. We ran out of medicine. We had people sick with uh, malaria, dysentery. Some of them had started showing signs of beriberi, wet beriberi. The wet beriberi hit first, but then the dry beriberi was very close behind it. And beriberi is, uh, is it's not a disease. It's, uh, your kidneys quit functioning. And then all the fluid goes into your body. And you start swelling. Usually it starts in your feet and your ankles and your knees and comes right on up. And eventually it will get into your head, and your head will swell about like this. Your eyes will be that far back in there. And I was in the hospital in Camp 17 in Japan. Uh, I'd been moved there. And uh, I was put in a bunk in what they call a hospital uh, ward, and across the aisle was a Dutchman. He was captured down in Java. And he was a big fellow. Oh, he was huge, and his head was big as a pumpkin. And his fingers were extended. He couldn't close his fingers. His arms were straight. And uh, that night, their chaplain, the chaplain came in and gave him a little block of chocolate. And he, in the military, we have what's called Type D chocolate bars. They had six little squares to a bar. And the crew down there, if you was on a crew in the mine and load 16 cars of coal, they would favor the, you with a, one of these chocolate bars. There were six men on a crew. Each man got a little square. Well, Chapman gave this Dutchman a, that, that chocolate. And he, he stayed there until the Dutchman got it all dissolved and swallowed. But sometime after that, I heard water. During the night, I heard water f flowing, just like turning the faucet up. And, uh, of course, I didn't get up. I wasn't able to. But then in the morning, that Dutchman had lost all of his water. And he looked about like that skeleton back there. And he lasted just about 30 minutes after, dead light, uh, after daylight, and uh, he died. I mean, that, that, that was very, very. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I just want to tell you something about Barry Barry, though, and what it would do to you. Uh, but we were down on the front lines in the Philippines, and I was squad leader. I had 12 men, and we were, had an outpost line of resistance about three-quarters of a mile out in front of our main line. And we would man that outpost line of resistance sparsely. And the purpose was that you would start absorbing and holding down an attack until the main line could get themselves get it together and get ready to, uh, to, to fight. And uh, I was out there one night, heard, heard this guy snoring. Now, this was on the edge of a rice paddy, and we were in a hedge row on the edge of this rice paddy. Heard, I heard this boy snoring. So I went down, and we were about 50 feet apart. I went down the line until I found this boy that was snoring. I kicked him. Because, you see, on that outpost line of resistance, those Japs, at night, they put the rifle on their back, and it might take them six or eight hours to roll across that rice paddy, and they hear this guy snoring. That's where they're going to roll to. And that happened over there, not in our section, but in the other section. And when, when this guy rolls over, this guy is 
snoring, all he's going to do is grab him and kill him. Then he can go down the line and, and get the rest of the squad. Well, I kicked this old boy and I told him, I said, Oh, you got you got to you got to uh, stay awake. I said, you know, you can be court martial for going to sleep on duty like this on guard duty. And he said, I wasn't asleep. He said, I just had my eyes closed. And I said, Yeah, you were snoring. That's the reason I came up here. And uh, so I walked off down to the end, and a few minutes I heard the guy snoring again. And I had to stay with him that night. I had to stay with him to keep him awake, and I could have turned him in, and he would have been shot. But I couldn't do it because of the circumstances we were under. Everybody was sick. We were overworked. Uh, we were under shell fire all the time. The men were worn out. We didn't have any food. They were hungry. And uh, under the circumstances, I couldn't turn the boy in. Well, that's one of the things that happened while I was up there. Another thing is uh, this berry berry. Dry berry, berry and scurvy, uh, these things started showing up on the men up on the front. And uh, that contributed a lot to uh, so many men dying later on because they were already physically drained. They didn't have anything to back up. You didn't know you can go a day or two without something to eat, but you, didn't, you won't lose your strength and so forth. But I mean, when you go week in, week out, uh, month in, month out, without uh, sufficient food, you use everything that your body has stored over the years. You use all that up, and and you're you're going to die. You're going to catch one of these diseases just as easy, and that will kill you because we didn't have medicine. Well, the Japanese broke through the Philippine army on our left flank and uh, one night well the next morning we could see them we knew the fighting was going on down there because we could hear it but after it got daylight we could see the Japanese broadening this breach they had made in the Philippine army well it was really too far for us to shoot so our commander came running in, running in from the outpost between the main line and the OPLR, the outpost line, he, he had moved out there because he was scared to stay back behind us because they were bombing and stressing behind, but they wasn't doing anything out in that no man's land. And uh, he come running by and he said, uh, Sergeant, he said, get these men ready to, to move out as soon as I ring the gong. Because we could see Japs landing uh, on the beach to our right, a mile or two away from us. And they had been landing there during the night. And it, you begin hearing firing going on behind you. You got these breach over here, and the Japanese are coming around behind. And uh, so our platoon sergeant, he, he, he said, after about an hour, he said, and these guys, these Japs are begin spreading. And he sent a runner back to the uh, CP and find out what's going on. Nobody out there. Everybody's gone. The, the what you what normally would call orderly room. It, it was bare. Everything was gone. Everybody was gone. No officers. No first sergeants. Uh, anybody. So when he came back and reported, the platoon sergeant told us, "said man, he said, go ahead and destroy your machine guns." And he said, uh, "You're on your own." He said, "Try to get to Craigador." Craigador was a fortified island sitting in the mouth of Manila Bay. Well, that was a heck of a position to be in. We hadn't been there long enough to know anything about the Philippine Islands or the natives. And uh, so that left us in, in bad, gave us a bad feeling. Hey, we, we, we're abandoned. What do we do? The Japs are going to take care of you in just a few minutes if you don't settle down and start thinking. And well, anyway, there's five of us got together in the group, in my squadron, and we started working our way through the jungle. Well, we ran into a, a, an artillery outfit, and the way we ran into it, we, we broke in 
into a clearing in a jungle, and there's grass about waist high. And just as we broke through out of the jungle, uh, the edge of the jungle there, this, we heard battery fire, and there's a 75, battery 75 millimeter gun sitting back there, and they had fired, and normally when the battery fire, you can see the smoke come out of them, you know. Well, that smoke came right straight ahead. They were firing right straight ahead. Well, we say, we can't, we can't, uh, we can't handle this, so as soon as they fired, we jumped up and headed across that clearing. And it was a uh, jungle tree, limbs down on the ground, and uh, it was getting late in the afternoon, and we saw some dirt, fresh dirt, on, on, the, on the limb, and there bound to be a hole under there. And we figured we'd get in there for the night. Well, we bailed in there, and, and hey, there was already some people in there, but we couldn't see them. It was so dark. And uh, after a while, Jesse Knowles, so Jesse Knowles was from Louisiana. Uh, he was a senator over there for years. And uh, uh, he, 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 was, he was a sergeant in our squadron. And he said, well, he said, we're in here for the night. He said, we need to kind of make some plans, find out who's in here and what we can do. And he said, I'm Jesse Knowles from Louisiana. And he said, this is Jam Goche from Mississippi. And before he introduced anybody else, somebody spoke up on these dark figures back there. He said, uh, James Goche, he said, do you know anybody by the name of Uncle Walter? I said, yeah, that's my grandpa. He said, well, you and I used to hunt down there and fish down there on the banks of that river in Goche. He said, I used to come down there with Aunt Lillian. Well, Aunt Lillian's my Aunt Lillian, too. And uh, so, yeah, I remember him. His name was Roy Clark. And uh, so we talked a while there, you know, and we finally went to sleep, and the next morning, uh, about daylight, we started crawling out of there, and this 75 battery, battery 75s, there was a major in charge of it, and we said, well, we'll go through there, maybe we got something to eat. And we got there, the major said, you men go down here about 300 yards. He said, I already got some men down there. He said, you hold the Japs away from here until we get our artillery out. Well. We went down there. We heard the first truck pull out, another truck pull out, third truck pull out, and the fourth truck pulled out. Well, they left us again. Well, we were, and now by this time, it was Japanese all through the jungle. And uh, so we, we started for the uh, south again. And the, uh, uh, I don't know, I lost two of them somewhere along the line there scattered in the jungle there, trying to work your way through. And uh, then I ended up, I was just by myself. And I came to a, a large uh, grouping of bamboo. And where the animals would go through there, there was trails through this bamboo, about four feet high the trail was. So I had to get down. I got down there. I said, well, I'm going to see if I can get through it. So I started crawling. And I came to where it turned, you know, and I went around that turn, and here was a kid. And uh, I looked at him again. He had a gray beard, but he wasn't about three feet high. Not over three and a half at the most. Gray beard, he had on a little child's, about a five or six-year-old child's coat, dress coat. And he had his G-string on. And he had his blowgun with him. He was a Negrita, one of the natives over there. And it scared the fool out of him, to tell you the truth. And so I, I asked him, I said, that Japanese? And he couldn't speak much English, but uh, he, knew, he, he knew Japanese. And uh, he, he most made it follow him. And uh, so I followed him around until he got to the other side of that bamboo. And I thanked him in English. He probably didn't know what I said, but he probably understood. And I went on through the jungle from there. But uh, I run into Enzo then. I, after I got through that bamboo, here was Enzo. He was one of the fellows that was with me originally. And uh, 
we found a little trail, so we followed this little trail, brushing the uh, jungle growth out of the way, you know, and we broke into a clearing, and there's a big tree there, and uh, somebody said, you know, it's a good thing you all made a little noise, said, I had you in my sights. <laughs> Looking around, here was a tank. This tank was camouflaged right there by that tree. And there's a guy sitting up there with a 30 cal machine gun. When he heard us coming through the jungle, he, he, had his, he had his side on us. But then there was two of those tra uh, tanks there, one here and one oh, about 50 feet to the other side, and they were pointing down a, a jungle trail. And he, he, this guy said, said y'all better move on out of here. He said, there's going to be a lot of action going on here. There's some Jap tanks coming. And he said, we're waiting for them. And they were aimed down this trail, you know, and you could hear the tanks. And we took on off up the hill, and they found some big hole up there, shell hole. And we said, we're sitting and watch some of the action. And uh, so we, Andrew and I sit there, and this was a, pine, a pineapple patch we were in. And we sit there, and sure enough, here come those tanks. And they come around the curve, Another one come around the curve, and there was infantry with them all around this tank. Another one, a third one came around the curve, and that's when our tanks opened up with 37 millimeter shells. That's all they had, and the machine gun. And uh, I tell you for sure, it was, it was a lot of action. And Enzo and I, and Enzo say, we better get out of here, Cajun. Uh, my nickname was Cajun. And. Uh, he said, we better get out of here because they ain't going to be able to hold off all those, all those tanks. So we took on off to the jungle heading south. And somewhere between there and the National Highway, after I crossed over Mount Franklin, uh, Mount uh, uh, Marvellous, uh, I lost Enzo again. Now mind you, we hadn't been eating anything. We, we hungry. We had fever. And... Uh, I got, early one morning, after I crossed, crossed this uh, marvelous mountain, I came up on a national highway which ran along uh, uh, Manila Bay all the way around to uh, San Fernando Pampanga, really, you know, and on to Manila. But uh, when I came up on the highway, there was a roadblock on my left, and there was two MPs standing there. They, they had their white dress uh, covers to the caps, you know, and they had white gloves on, and had the white belt, and a, a machine, I mean, uh, pistol holders, you know, and they had on the white spats, and they had this roadblock. And as I got up there, one of them hollered, Soldier, come here. And I started up there. He said, I got close to him, he said, We got orders to send every straggler back to the front line. And I was going to tell him that the front line was pretty close behind me. But I didn't get a chance to because one of those Jap machine guns opened up. And they, they fired with like, Prrr! I mean, they were fast firing machine gun. Well, neither to say those MPs disappeared. So I headed on down the road to Marvellous. But uh, you see, we had six squadrons uh, in the group. Uh, we had a complement of 880 men, uh, average. You lose two, before, add some, and subtract some. And uh, so we, we, we got on down there, and, and uh, it was kind of hard to find somebody out of your group where all the, this mass of people were down around Marvellous little dock. And it must have been 100,000 or more people, including uh, the Filipino natives. They're just milling in there. Well, uh, it wasn't long before General King, our commander of all forces on Bataan, uh, he decided to, to uh, keep from having a massacre of men and women, kids and soldiers and whatever, that he would have to surrender because there's no way we could, there's no way we could fight the Japanese. And uh, so he, he surrendered his troops on Bataan. Well, after he surrendered, these Japs came in, and they lined us up, made us stand up in a, in a formation, and uh, they had a hundred of us in a, in a formation. 
And then these Jap soldiers were searching. They told you first, this one Jap officer told them, everything, everything on the ground in front of everything. And uh, so that's what we did. Of course, some of the guys, they had rings, they had uh, watches and uh, money and so forth. And uh, that had to be laid down. And they did cut the finger off of one fellow not too far from me because he couldn't get his ring off. You know, I mean, just like my ring here. I can't hardly get, in fact, I have to wet it to get it off. That was taking too much time. This guy pulled out a little Japanese sword about this long. Yeah, he cut it. And he got, he got that, he got the ring. Well, if they found any money, if you had any Japanese money, you were dead. They killed you right there. No, no trial, anything. And uh, another thing I like to talk about is tell about this particular time when they were inspecting us, looking at our uh, belongings. They took all your watches. They took your rings. They took any money you had. They took everything loose that they, they, you had. They, they, they might want. And some of them had watches uh, all the way up the arm. You know, where they take them off. Again. But there was a medical corpsman. I don't know, he's right close to me, right where I could hear him and see him. And this Jap had moved down the line, got to him, you know, and uh, here was a bottle of pills. A bottle of pills like that. And they were pretty, they were pretty, pretty capsules. And uh, this Jap picked them up and looked at them, you know, and jabbering something in Japanese. He took the top off of it and poured some in his hand. He looked at them, they were pretty pills. He threw them in his mouth, took his canteen, washed them down, you know. And this Coleman, he said, I got me one. <laughs> and sure enough, before we, before we moved off, this chap was on the ground on his back, and he may have still been conscious, but uh, he wasn't going anywhere. So I'm sure that whatever it was, it killed him. And uh, they started us on this march. Now this is a, you get a lot of stories about this, this march. I know I, I, I just read the other day an account given to a newspaper uh, that this guy was, he had been captured on Corregidor. And he was telling all about the death march and everything, you know, that he had been at. Well, if they were captured on Corregidor, they did not go make the death march. But he was telling everybody what took place on that death march. So uh, he was in that, see. But he couldn't have been. No way, no possible way he could have been in that. But anyway, there's a lot of people that do that, and that gives a wrong impression of what really happened. This guy said in there, he said, oh, he said, you hear about a thousand people died, selling the road littered with bodies. And he said there was only about 600 people uh, were killed on the death march. He didn't know. He wasn't there. He had probably died if he had been there. He probably wouldn't have made it. But uh, they started us out on a march up the National Highway, run, run along the primitive uh, Manila Bay, and the destination was uh, uh, San Fernando Pampanga, which was just about 65 miles from Miss Marvelous, the town of Marvelous. Now, remember now, we hadn't had anything to eat for days now. And we had malaria, we had dysentery. Some of the guys already started having dry bear, uh, dry bear, bear. Dry bear, bear is a nervous, a nerve thing, your, your nerves start reacting, I guess, and that, that's terrible pain. Now, I'd rather have the wet bearberry any day than a dry bearberry because those guys at, in prison camp, you walk by in the backs where these guys with dry bearberry were, and if you, if you made a, a movement with your hand, like you're going to reach up and scratch your head, and it'd squall. I mean, it just set off that pain. And, but anyway, they started us on this march. Now, all these little barrios along the way, 
and it, it was 10, 15 miles, it'd be a little barrio. A little barrio was a little town. And each one of these barrios had an artesian well, and they'd have a, a, a piece of concrete about 10, 12 feet square, and this pipe coming up here with a T on it, and it's about, look like about two or three inches uh, stream of water coming out and splashing on this, on this concrete. Well, this is a community well. This is where they got their water. Well, if you broke and went for that water, the two guards behind you, they would start shooting. And if you take 100 men and hit, hit this place, some of them are going to get some water. Some of them are going to get out. But if we got water, got back on the road, you're all right. But uh, if, they might get you before you got your water. Uh, so we lost a lot of men taking advantage of these water things splashing out there. And uh, your tongue will get kind of like mine is now, Jim. You got some water over there? I need yeah. <laughs> But the, the, uh, these guys, their lips would... And mine was the same way. It, it was swollen. They were cracked. Uh, you hadn't had any water intake. Uh, and your nostrils would start uh, clogging up with seepage of some kind. And your throat would get dry. And your tongue felt like a stick of wood in your mouth. And uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't, couldn't swallow. And I know in my case, I was... I was delirious, I guess you would call it, uh, when we came to a stream. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Y'all, sure. pardon me. Even talking about it made me thirsty, sir. <laughs> but I think it was the second day. I don't know, it was sometime in the morning, or the, I believe it was the second day. It could have been the third day. We came to uh, a bridge that had been blown, and it was covering a, a little stream that came out of the mountains, and it was just flowing right on out into the gulf, into the bay, and uh, these Japanese told us we could have water. You know, of course, they, they they, they just motioned. We didn't know what they said when they say eco mizune. We didn't know what they said, but uh, that meant they'd go get water. And uh, so it would break for that water. It's pretty. Yeah, I mean, it's rippling. It's coming down. Get your head under the water and just soak it up. Drink and drink and drink and drink. And your eyes begin clearing when you raise up. You know, your eyes start clearing and you start looking looking around and here's these bloated bodies that was also floating down out of, out of the uh, the mountains there and on out into the bay but anyway I just went down and got as much more as I could have because I didn't could handle them because I didn't know when I'd get any more but on the either third night or the fourth night they run us into a little compound, Bob wire fence they'd set up, and they run us in there, and they, they'd pack you in there and pack you in there and pack you in there until just like sardines, and you, you sit down, you, you're sitting on somebody's legs, or they were sitting on your legs, leaning up against your back. And, and uh, the, uh, before, you went in, before we went in the end of this place, as we marched in before we got to this play, this uh, compound, they made us get single file, put us in single file, and we were walking single file. And the reason for that is because you go get to the entrance of the, this place, and just before you got there, there was Japs on each side, and they had clubs, and uh, they were they were all working out. I mean, they, you went through there; they didn't stop you anything. They just haul off and hit, hit you with a club, you know. And if you went down, there was a whole stack of them pulled off to the side. There's some other Japs, and they'd, they'd pull the guys off, and just like stacking cardwood over here. 
And uh, I was, I, I saw what was going on, and I, I, I started figuring, because there's, there's one fella getting through this, these jabs of the club, there's one fella getting through there without being hit. And, uh, and I thought to myself, oh boy, I said, I'm not going to get it, I'm going to get through. But this guy that was in front of me, Sergeant Knox, and I told him later I ought to kill him. Uh, he saw that too, see. So he steps out and gets behind me. Well, I had a old uh, Philippine coconut hat, kind of like a Frank Buck hat, made of that coconut stuff. And I, I'd picked it up on the side of the road somewhere. And when I got there, I knew the blow was coming. And I squinched down this way, and, and he hit me on the back of it. It got the back of it hat and, and caught my shoulders and my knees started going. So said, hey, you're already weak. We're already weak. My knees started going. I said, Lord, let me, just let me, let me get through here. And pretty soon they began straightening up, you know, and I went on in. Incidentally, I saw Knox later on on truck driving detail, uh, close to guy in Guff, and he come up waltzing up today. You know, I hadn't seen him in a long time. And we, he, he wasn't with our group. He was another group of chat. He kind of walks up there and says, Cajun, I'm glad to see you. I said, you, then I cussed him. I said, I ought to kill you, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, so far, at any of our reunions, he's never made a reunion. Uh, I mean, you, you know, I brought it up one time at one of our reunions, just talking about some people who hadn't been there that were in our group. And I told him, I said, well, they either did something that they were ashamed of, or they, they just don't want to talk to anybody that was with them over there at that time. And there's several of them. And there's a couple of them right there. Well, uh, Irby was one of them. He's a, a Knox. He, they both live in Boja City, in Louisiana. Of course, Knox is in a wheelchair. He's about about gone. And in the when I wrote that book, I didn't put people's name in there uh, that that would cause hard feelings, you know. Because I've forgiven all of them for anything they ever caused trouble for me, and there was a lot of them that caused trouble for the prisoners. One prisoner causing trouble for another one. But uh, I survived that, and while we were sitting in there, uh, and it was going to be for the, for the night, uh, there was commotion took place. Now, we've got about six, 700 men in this compound, and the commotion took place. Got to looking, I looked over to see what it was all about, and here was this Jap soldier, and he had his rifle holding like this, and his bayonet, and his man that was stuck up through the throat of one of the heads that they had cut off, the American boy. And he was walking around like this among the troops. And, of course, I never did cut my eye. I didn't let any of the Japs see me looking at it. And it wasn't long before two more Japs got them a couple of heads and prayed around among the troops. I mean, that's the type, kind of people they were. He, I mean, you couldn't help but uh, thank God you wasn't one of those heads. But it's awful. They cut the head off and be jagged, you know, and it, it'd be their face would be solid gray, and, and with dust covering and so forth. But anyway, we were there that night. The next night, they run us into a compound. Well, in, in the meantime, is uh, on the, on this march, uh, the Filipinos would throw food to us if they could do it without being seen. And uh, some Filipino, before we got, got to where he was, had thrown a piece of coconut, about like that, white coconut, you know, I could break out of a coconut. And I had a, uh, there was a lieutenant colonel and a captain next uh, in this group that I was with, and they both saw it at the same time and they went after it, and they got in a fight. And we just parted and went right on around and left them fighting. Uh, because I, 
hey, Jeff wouldn't put up, they'd kill him. He'd, and they may have. They may have killed him. I don't know. I don't know what happened to him. But uh, it took me around six days, I think, uh, to make this, this, this uh, trip all the way into Camp O'Donnell, which was the final destination. Now, we made this march about 65 miles to San Fernando, Pampanga. The next day, now there's where we got some good food, was at San Fernando, Pampanga. When we marched us in there that afternoon, uh, it was a schoolhouse yard. Uh, they had a table set up, and uh, they had like little wash pots that uh, you see back out in the country where they put the clothes in there with a stick and they jam them, you know. Well, that's where the Japs cooked their rice, was in these big pots. And they had two of them, I believe it was, best I can remember, sitting on this uh, table. And here, like I say, we, I'm, I'm bleary-eyed. I've been burning up with fever, and I'm sick. And so I'm just, and when I saw them giving rice out, I, I tried to find something to get rice in. I found a board there, and I picked it up. It was an odd, long, oblong-looking board. I brushed it good, and when I got up there, I was still looking at that board, you know. And I got up there, and somebody said, Cajun. I looked up, and it was old Nose, Jesse Nose. And uh, he hit me. I mean, that board, he loaded that thing up with rice. That was the best food I ever had. But then the next morning, it got back to the... Uh, uh, bad part of the trip. They took us down to, marched us down to a railroad station. And they had narrow gauge railroad cars over there. Uh, they're metal box cars. And uh, we got down there and they were loading us on, on the box cars. And they, they'd already loaded a bunch of them before they got to us. And I could see that, hey, they, the first ones that they loaded, they done closed the doors, the boxcar doors. Well, they started getting close to me, and I was trying to figure out some way that I could, maybe could get close to the door because it had to be some cracks. It got, got to be some cracks around that door. And uh, so sure enough, I managed to stay out the, out the way of getting bayonets. This, this packing in with a bayonet, that's how they, that's how they loaded it. And, uh, when I got in and, and got just jammed, and here comes the door, slamming the door, I was just about six inches from the edge of that door, and that's fresh air, because there's cracks around this metal, fresh, metal door. Now, we were packed so tight in these things that in the morning, say 9 o'clock in the morning, about what time it was, in the lowlands, in those <laughs> tropics, and they closed these metal doors. You're in a metal door there, and, and you start suffocating. You need air. They don't have air. And this lasted about three or four hours on this train before anybody got out. But these guys that suffocated. Now, mind, all, all this time, I'm, I'm telling you, remember, these guys have diarrhea, and they, have, and they don't give you chance to uh, go to the bathroom or the toilet. I mean, right there. So you got you, you all smeared up and felt thin. But these guys that died, they couldn't fall. They, they might break, but that's as far as it goes. Packs are tight. And when they opened the doors, that's when these dead ones fell. Well, those of us survived. We got out and Hey, they formed us back in a group of 100 and started us marching again. We didn't know where we were going, but they was marching us. And after about seven or eight miles, we came to this uh, camp. It was a Filipino army camp. And they hadn't finished the construction of it. It had a lot of the barracks up, but it hadn't been finished. And uh, they marched us to this camp, and they stopped us out in front of uh, uh, an administrative building of some kind. And uh, we were standing in formation. They wouldn't let you sit down. You had to stand there and stood there and stood there. And these Japs running around. Finally, an a interpreter, a Filipino interpreter, came out and told us that 
the, the general's going to talk to you. Well, a little while, here come the general. Actually, I think he was a, a tie. I think he was a captain. But anyway, he was had a shiny uniform on. He had those boots up, you know, shiny, glassy, shiny on. He had those that saber swinging, swinging on his side. And, uh, he gets out there and he climbs up on this jeep, American jeep. And the Filipino climbed up with him, this interpreter. And he, this Japanese uh, said, we could hear him say English and American. But we didn't know what they were talking about in the other Japanese. But then the Filipino would interpret what he said for us. And he said the English and the, Jap and the uh, Americans were their enemy and that they would always be their enemy. He didn't say this during this war. He meant always, and they still are. Uh, they're our enemy, but we take them as friendly. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's the reaction we are. Our government is to them, I'll put it that way. But, uh, and a lot of us, that, uh, a lot of people who have been over there and and to get sidetracked, I got a letter from a fellow in Alabama. He was a, a B-29 pilot, a, B, a B-20, a 17 pilot in Germany, through 35 missions, and uh, before he came home and got out. But he was an engineer, and he went to Japan after the after after he got out of the service, and after the war was over and everything. And he went over there as an engineer to build, help him build the place back. And he said he had around 30 Japanese engineers. He said they were real, real humble sort of people. And uh, he said the, the, the engineer that I appointed in charge, he said he invited me, he took me out to his house, invited me out to his house several times for dinner while he was over. He and his wife uh, went to his house for dinner. He said, hey, most humble people. He said, until I read your book. And somebody had given him my book from North Carolina. It mailed the book to him. They're a friend of his, you know. And he said he just he he just couldn't believe it. And uh, I said, well. And in that in the book, I said that they they were humble people, but kind of like a a tiger or a panther. You you couldn't change the spots, and eventually they'd get you. I mean, you read about it in the paper every once in a while. Somebody got a pit lion or a tiger or something, and they attacked me. I'm the baby or somebody, you know. But anyway, we, uh, this guy on that Jeep was talking away, and the interpreter was interpreting it for us, and all of a sudden this lieutenant or captain, whatever, turned around, and he hit that Filipino with the back of his hand, and he said, I didn't say that. I mean, perfect English. You know? He didn't say that. He spoke good English, but they wouldn't address us in English. We were, we, were, we were captives. We were not prisoners. They told us many times that we were captives and, and not prisoners. So that meant we were slaves. And for three and a half years, we were slaves. The Japanese army sold us to the Japanese industry. And the Japanese industry paid the the Japanese civilians for us. And uh, that was a hard pill to swallow, too. And we're working in the mine. In my case, I work in the mine. Those overseers come along. If you, was, you might be on your stomach in a lateral with a tire tool, which is about the most we ever had to dig with, scraping out this coal dust that uh, they call coal. And uh, this overseer, Jap overseer, come by, and he always had something like a big broomstick. And he didn't have to not be doing anything. He just walked by there and laid it on you tell, you tell you to get to work. Get to work. Man, should go to Toxando. Work. But anyway, in uh, 1945, August of 45, they brought us up out of the mine one day in an afternoon. And when they, when they brought us up, we couldn't, we couldn't understand what was going on. 
Now, previous to this, them bringing us up, the Americans had, had been bombing Japan. They bombed this area that we were in. In fact, some of the bombs hit in our, our, our camp. And uh, then all of a sudden, they, no more airplane, no more bombing. And this had gone been about two weeks when they brought us up out of the mine, and they took us to our, uh, to our uh, barracks that we were in. And uh, then they came down, they got the Boon Tai Joe that was in charge of our, the American that was in charge of our barracks. And they went down and got the Boon Tai Joe, the supervisor that was appointed, took him and marched him off. And we had felt all along that the Japanese would, would uh, not let the Americans recapture any, any, any American prisoners. And uh, we felt the Japanese would kill us prior to letting us be captured, or be recaptured. Well, we, we got together right quick when they went, because we figured they'd take the top nine and people out, might confuse the rest of us. They'd take them out and kill them. And, uh, but in a little while, they came back. And uh, each one of them had a, had a Red Cross package on his shoulder, a little square box about like that. Well, he, he, got, he, he got 10 men, marched them off up to the warehouse. Now, in all these years over there, the Red Cross had been sending Red Cross food, little boxes about like this. It'd have uh, uh, ham and eggs and little little can, you know, and it, they'd have jelly and they'd have coffee and uh, crackers and milk and uh, use a couple of packages of cigarettes, uh, chocolate uh, candy, and, and uh, the Japanese had been stacking them in the warehouse, and that's what the Japanese were eating. The you know, Japs were eating, eating this food, but they didn't give it to us unless we worked and earned a favor from them, like the little chocolate, but, uh, square of chocolate. And, uh, so they brought us back into camp, and each one of us got us a, uh, a Red Cross box, and uh, some people couldn't handle it, though. Uh, it's too much for them, too rich, uh, the food was too rich, and immediately they throw up. But uh, the next morning, there wasn't any Japs in camp. Japs were gone, none, no guards anywhere. Now, this is a big camp. We had 1,700 people there, uh, Dutch, English, and Americans, and um, uh, the Australians. And uh, there was no, and there was, that's in this, there was a 10 or 12 foot solid board fence all the way around our camp, encompassing the entire camp. And uh, so somewhere the next morning, after the sun had been up a good while, Somebody said, the Japs are coming up the road. Well, they came in, but there was a fellow with them that, and he was, uh, he was a healthy-looking rascal. That rascal, was, his cheeks were rosy, you know, and, and uh, he was, oh, he, was, he was, looked like a huge person. We used to looking at skeletons now. That's what we're used to looking at. But here, this guy came in there with authority, you know. I mean, he... He, he just had uh, had everything for him, and he got up on a stand call for for an assembly of all troops. And this was a war correspondent, uh, and he had landed with the first Americans that run into Japan on an aviation engineer group down on Kyushu Island at uh, Omu at uh, Kanoi on the southern tip of the island, and uh, he told us during this his address to us that it took him three days to travel by train from Kanoi up to our camp. And uh, of course, the American officer in charge of our camp uh, told us that nobody will leave camp. He said it's too dangerous, the Japanese are still under arms, and uh, it, it wouldn't be uh, prudent to go out and leave yourself open for attacks or death of being killed. Well, we got to thinking about that. There's five of us there in the barracks got to thinking about it. Say, hey, he came up here from Kanoi on a train. 
we should be able to go down there on a train. If he could come up there on a train, we could go down there. So we kicked some boards off of the fence, and we went down to the railroad station, and and uh, we came up on the blind side of the station there. And sure enough, they were loading Japanese troops into coaches. There's five coaches there. They were loading these tra troops. We climbed up in the cab of the engine and uh, the locomotive, and, and uh, they, when we started up in there, the, the fireman told the, uh, the uh, engineer told the fireman to call the Kimpeitai. And uh, <laughs> we, I don't know, one, one of the guys grabbed the fireman by the shoulder, you know, told him, you call the Kimpeitai, we'll throw you in this firebox. And uh, told the engineer that we were going to Kanoi. And he said he wasn't going to Kanoi. His orders had to go somewhere else. And he said the road forks 75 miles, and this road forks. He said, I've got to go here. My orders play over here. So we get down there. Now, they'd unloaded all these troops on the train, on their coaches. We get down here, and the engineer, he stopped, sure enough, because there was a fork in the road. So he didn't get out, and the fireman didn't get out, but a couple of our boys got out and unhooked the coal car from the coaches. And we went to Kanoi. Well, the engineer softened up a little after that. And uh, cause we left those five little cars. And it was out in the boondock. I, know, I don't know. It wasn't any town. Didn't see any towns. It was rugged country over there. And I don't know how they ever got those Japs unless another train came along and hooked on to them. But this Japanese engineer, uh, we came into the town that night, and uh, he had done come over on the outside, you might say. He figured there's no point in resisting. And he said, I'll take you to the hotel and get some food, get some meal, something to eat. Well, that's fine. It, it must have been uh, 10, maybe 12 of us by this time. That we picked, we got us a boxcar, and we, we'd come through a state, and he'd be an American prisoner down there uh, at this station. He'd climb aboard, you know, and because uh, we had prisoners scattered all over those islands there in Japan, and so we went down to this hotel with this engineer, and that's the first time we'd ever been in a Japanese uh, hotel or restaurant or anything else, and have to pull your shoes off. Well, I tell you, we <laughs> we looked like skeletons, and we didn't have much shoes anyway in the first place, and. Uh, we had to go in and sit down around a little old table about about a foot and a half high, I guess, and you had to sit on the on the mat around there. And sure enough, they started bringing food in there, and they they loaded us down with Japanese food, and that that was a, a very good meal. But anyway, the next day we went on to, to Kanoi on that trip. And when we pulled in the railroad station there, I don't know if it was the next day or the following day, uh, there was two MPs uh, marching up and down in this railroad station. Nobody else around, but they was there on guard duty, and they had Tommy guns. And this engineer pulled, pulled us in there and stopped. And some of us went into the, a box, this boxcar that we had picked up, and uh, of course, when we pulled in with this boxcar, these these guards, and hey, again, they look just like elephants there. I mean, they are, they look huge, and they they got to the they went back to this boxcar, and they look and say, where where in a little profanity y'all been? And say, well, we've been in prison. We just got out of prison, and. Uh, and by this time, the engineer and fireman then got out and was coming towards us. And uh, this one looked at us and oh, it got to him. He swung around and said, what do you want to do with these? And he was in a little profanity. He said, no, no, they brought us down here. They've been good to us. And uh, incidentally, the engineer and the fireman thanked us in Japanese. No more had to go to much, you know, that kind of trembling, see. But uh, these MPs took us out to their camp, and uh, the first thing that happened was uh, this little doctor 
stuck a, uh, a thermometer in our mouth. Hey, that wasn't, that, that, that didn't do any good. I mean, I told him, I said, we just need something to eat, doctor. And I said, we get well. And uh, anyway, they deloused us. Uh, we were eaten up with lice. And uh, we slept on straw mats, and they were full of lice. Uh, mine clothed, we wore down to the mine, all the seams. They're just lined with, with my uh, lice. And that was our pastime, to sit down and get these gnats, pump, squash them out of your seams of your clothes. Cause they, but anyway, they took us in there and stripped us. Then the first thing they did, they had a, a squirt gun and it, it was some kind of powder in it, and they told us to close our eyes and they, they sprayed it all over us, you know. And uh, then they told us to go into the washroom there and take a shower. They gave us soap and towel and everything. We went in there and uh, took a good bath. And oh, I mean, even where we were, where we worked at a uh, mine and camp in Japan, the only bath we had was a, a big vat. And uh, they kept it hot. I don't know, it just felt like it would burn you if you got in it. But when you got out of it, you were. You were real red all over. And uh, in the winter time, uh, that that heat would last just about 30 minutes, but you were warm for that period of time. But uh, to take a shower, and soap, and and towel, washcloth, and dry off, and they'd given us a new uniform to set out that khaki uniform, and, and uh, hey, they, we were living. We had started living right then. That's when we started living, and. Uh, the, as soon as we got through with the medical people there in their tent, they told us to go over to this big tent. And they pointed the big tent over and said, that's, that's the mess tent. So you go over there and they'll have some food for you. Well, I think every cook in that camp was over there to cook. And it, it didn't make any difference what you wanted. Just tell them. They, 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 they would do it. I mean, and they were cooking, uh, they were cooking hot cakes and syrup and they was cooking eggs and bacon and steaks and pork chops and you know, I mean just whatever you wanted tell them and they, they had it for you and they had cartons after cartons of cigarettes uh, cases sitting over here to get get all the cigarettes you want get all this uh, chocolate they had cartons of this this uh, military chocolate bars and uh, so we ate and I, I, when we, after we got through with that, they told us we had the tent next, next to them there. So that's, uh, you sleep there tonight. And I went over there and the, had a mattress on it, had sheets on it, it had a nice blanket on it, and it turned down, you know. Here was a pillow with a, a white pillowcase on it. and I, I had one of those chocolate bars with me. And when I went to sleep, I, I was, it had it in my mouth, I guess. And the next morning I woke up, uh, I just finished it. I finished what I had in my mouth the next morning when I woke up. But they, uh, they put us on uh, uh, what they call a jungle skipper, twin engine, the old Goonie Bird type plane, a K, uh, C-47. And they're going to take us to Manila. But the first stop was Okinawa. So after we took off, I, I got up in the cockpit. I was the only one that was, uh, uh, had ever been an engineer of any kind. And, and I was talking to the pilots, you know, and the co-pilot. And I asked the pilot, I said, would you fly back over Camp 17? I said, fly back over and let's, let us uh, uh, drop a note to him. Yes, he liked that idea. So the co-pilot had one, he, he was from Texas, and he had one of these Texas bandanas. It looked like about that wide, it's black and red, you know, uh, design on it. And the crew chief had, had a, uh, a box there with all kinds of tools and nuts and bolts and whatever. So it made a, he made a parachute, the crew chief did, and I, I think there's about 12 of us on board. They already had some prisoners down there that were going to make this fly. But we, we took that out, and those of us from Camp 17, we wrote our name down on this piece of paper, and the crew chief wrapped it around a boat. 
and and tied it good and tied it to this handkerchief, you know, and the pilot circled around over there and the crew chief opened that side door and threw it out over the camp and we circled and it just looked like ants running towards that parachute that was coming down, see. And on that we gave our name and said, see you in the States. Well, <laughs> those of us that knew us knew that, hey, they were just here the other day. How'd they get out of here? You see? Because I saw some down in Manila that, that was there and, and when they got that parachute. And uh, they said they, the place just, people just left like that, going in all directions, trying to go, go to get someplace where they could get out and get back home. See? But uh, they said they were begging people to stay there to take care of those people who was uh, unable to move because of uh, sickness, you know. And uh, but we got got to uh, we got to Okinawa. Had to land there for for uh, uh, fuel. And this lieutenant, the pilot, told him, he said, "Hey, there's a Red Cross uh, trailer over there. Said they got cokes and donuts and." stuff there. He said, y'all want something to eat? Go over there. So we went over there and there's a master sergeant in front of me and sure enough, here was Coca-Cola and, and, not, and, and not in cans. They didn't have cans and they had the bottles. And here's a big platter of donuts, glazed donuts. And, and that old sergeant, he got him one on, hanging on each one of those fingers. And he reached up and he got that coat and, and turned to leave and that lady said, Sir, that would be so much, I'll give what it was. He said, lady, we don't have any money. She said, I'm sorry, but uh, you'll have to pay for this. And he put it all back on the county, you know. Well, this pilot saw, saw what, something was happening. He came away, what's the trouble? And, and the sergeant told him, he said, they want us to pay for it. We haven't got any money. Oh, that made that rascal mad. He got his bill full out and put $50 up there. He said, if, if it takes any more than this, he said, let me know. I'm going to be standing right here. He said, but that's the last you'll ever get out of me. So we all got something to eat, you know. And uh, we got to Manila. And from Manila, they put me on a, on a uh, Navy ship. And I think it was a cruiser. And I docked in San Francisco on November the 2nd, same day that I left to go to the Far East. Came back on November the second to uh, San Francisco, and uh, from there I went to Ashford General Hospital in West Virginia. And incidentally, I I was missing in action for 18 months before the Japs ever got a card out telling me I was a prisoner. But anyway, when I got off the bus out at Creole, then you know, from Creole, you know where I'm talking about Creole, Mississippi, over here at Moss Point, where the paper mill is. The bus station's right there across from the office of the paper mill. I get off the bus with my crutches and I, I, I got over to a cafe and, and called the house and well, nobody was there that could come get me. So I, I walked, I guess about a mile, I, I went with those crutches. It was at night and uh, to the house. Anytime y'all wanna ask a question, just, uh, Dr. Dunn, you, you have any questions you want to ask me about this? Well, yes, as a matter of fact. Uh, first of all, you make me hungry to talk about all this food that we take for granted. But when you surrendered, did you give any thought or any of your other soldiers give any thought to rather than surrendering to try to just... I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. I'll go closer. When you surrendered, or just before you surrender to the Japanese, did you give any thought to not surrendering and try to just make it in the jungle somehow? No, well, we didn't know what to do. I mean, it was just that simple. Uh, we, we didn't know the, we'd only arrived there on Thanksgiving Day in November, and uh, the war started for two weeks later. And uh, so we, we, we were completely ignorant of uh, anything that might take care of us in the mountains, or, you know. And then when we got up to Camp John Hay in the mountains, 
I didn't tell him about that. <laughs> when we got up to Camp John Hay in the mountains, uh, the, uh, uh, the, we were living so good, so good that, uh, hey, no point in trying to escape. Hey, it's worse in, 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 the, in the mountains because here we were getting good food. The Japanese wasn't bothering us too much. I mean, we took a whipping every once in a while, but, but hey, we got our health back. I went back up to 195 pounds, and we were hustling 55-gallon drums of gasoline and oil, and two of us take one of them and throw it up on the truck, another one stand there and, load, uh, you know, stand it up. It's funny about that. These uh, We'd go down and get these, this gasoline in Lowlands on Lin Yang Gulf at the town of San Fernando uh, La Union. And we'd be over there, had a guy in the, get up in the, in the boxcar and he'd roll it out onto the ground. And we'd get, get out and uh, down one on each end and we'd pick it up and roll it up in the truck, bed of the truck, and the guy in the truck, he'd take and stand it up. Well, these Japanese, they said, hey, that, that, my eyes. Month or nine, then Ginky Disco. And that, they, that's why I always come over there, you know, and they feel your arm, feel your muscles. Ginky Disco. And then they'd call some of their buddies, you know, and they'd come over there and they'd tell them to get around there, and they'd get around there on each end, and yeah, that butt fly up there, and they couldn't move it. <laughs> Pretty soon they'd get them all the way around. Eventually they'd get that up there, and Get it in the truck. Oh, come on, some tea. Can't get this toxin, you know. But, but they, uh, uh, at that time, I was up there two years. And uh, that's a rugged country, very rugged country. And a lot of the trails had just been primitive uh, carabao trails that was cut through these mountains to get into to the barrios and so forth. And uh, you're driving a truck, and, and you never had much speed in, in there because you, uh, you only had about a foot and a half, two feet from down yonder. And uh, they, these roads are cut right in solid rock up here. And as you go around the curve, the bed of your truck would be scraping, would scrape the edge of this mountain here. And we lost one fellow that we think the Jap made, uh, that was with him made him let him drive his truck because this Jap came back to camp that afternoon and told us that Hamilton was put tied up. He was, Hamilton died, and he ran over off the road up in the mountains. Hamilton, radio operator from out in uh, Los Angeles. And... Uh, then I was on a propaganda mission up there, and there's two trucks. My truck uh, was loaded with the Jap captain and the interpreter and uh, all their warrant officers and all, all their paraphernalia that they needed for propaganda, carry out a propaganda presentation. And uh, we went going back into headhunting country. This, this uh, was about 50 miles. We well, could go from Baguio to Bontoc, which is a pretty good sized barrio town. But then from Bontoc to this new bargain, that's where that trail bit come in. And they, they had gates that were 10, 15 miles. And if there's anything in the way, any carabao carts or whatever already in this, nobody else could come towards them. But anyway, we went to this new bargain. And they put on a, a, their show there that night. Incidentally, going into this town, around into this mountain here, and down there, probably three or 400 feet is a rounded this. Now, my sheer mountain, you can't hear anything over here that's making noise over here. So when I came around this mountain, here was a Igorot down the road there, three or 400 feet, something like that. He had a bowl on one hand, his right hand, and he had a head, about a hair, in this hand. Now, these, this is head-hunting country up there in, in, uh, in Lubagin. They were still hunting heads. In fact, 
friend of mine, Josephine, who was a beautiful young girl, about 16, uh, when we were in, uh, over there in San Fernando. And uh, she married a, a, a POW after the war was over. Several years later, this guy went back over there, and then they, they, they got married. She's, in, she's down here in, in uh, Nashville, Florida. She has a tailor shop and a restaurant, and uh, she's pretty well fixed. She comes over and visits every once in a while. And uh, so we, that night, when they made the presentation, one day Igor wrote, uh, gave us a, gave Wilson and I, Wilson and other fellow, Sergeant Wilson, uh, driving other truck that was fill, filled with guards. And they preceded us, a machine gun mounted on top of their truck. And they preceded us, and, and we followed in this, on this thing. And like I say, it's just that one trail there. And uh, so on the way back, well, that night, uh, one of these Filipinos gave Wilson a, 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 a what a McGill brewery bottle, gin bottle uh, full of bossy, uh, Filipino drink. Well, we, he and I decided we drank it. Got to feeling pretty high that night. And these, this town, they had their houses were huts, kind of like, it looked like an igloo. And they just had a grass hut and with a little entrance, you, they'd crawl in, you know, and slip right there on the straw or grass, uh, uh, grass or whatever. And around each one of them, throughout the, uh, this, this little barrio, they had a, about a six inch ditch dug around each one of them. And that's to keep water out of, the, out of their uh, little hut. And uh, I stepped in one of those that night and sprained my left foot, left ankle. And uh, the next morning, I couldn't hardly get my shoe on. It swollen so bad. But we left there after, after loading up, and we'd been out about, no, oh, maybe five miles. And I had a flat tire on the inside, uh, on the outside of my right rear tire. So, my goodness alive, we've got to put a spare on. Well, we don't have a spare. Well, we've got to take it off anyway. We don't have any tools. So I get a beating that right there that, that morning. Because we always dispose of any tools, any tires, wheels, all. Anytime we could drop a 55-gallon drum of gas or oil off in the mountains as we was coming back up, it rolled down the hill there for the, for the gorillas. And uh, so finally, what happened? They had to unload all the propaganda gear off my truck. And they got a rock. I finally got a rock, rolled it over due to the fulcrum to, uh, uh, to jack that truck up. And some of the camera crew had, a, had some tools. And it was hard, but I finally got the lugs off and took that flat tire off and turned the inside around so we'd have balance. You know, you, you, know, you got two tires there. If this one goes flat, you got this one sitting in here, you take and turn that one around and, and you balance your truck. And it wasn't but about a half a mile after that, I'm sitting there crying and uh, in the truck crying, driving. This Jap captain sitting on my right, and the Jap interpreter sitting next to the door. And I, I almost stopped to forward a little four-inch stream that comes down off the mountain and run across and down. And uh, I got to the other side. Well, I, I remembered that before I got to the other side, as you climb this little incline, and when you go around, you're going to go downhill again. So I was in low gear. And I pulled on up here, and I, I, I got up into second gear, and uh, I, I started around this this turn. My a bit of my truck scraping the side of that mountain, and in the old trucks, old cars, some of them, some of the older people <laughs> might remember, they had a had a throttle and a choke that came out of the dashboard. 
and then it, and his, his gear shift. Of course, this is a left-handed drive vehicle. My gear shift was down here, and uh, that, so when I dropped my hand off the steering wheel to 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 uh, shift because I was going to be going downhill, uh, I jumped. That's all. I mean, no premeditation, nothing. I jumped. And it must have somewhere between 300 and 500 feet that that truck loaded Japs went down with all their equipment. And some of them survived because where they'd cut out the road there, they, there's some outcropping of rocks. And that truck hit one time, and then it cleared the edge of the uh, rocks there, mountain, and went all the way to the riverbed. And uh, the only Japs that survived were the ones that was thrown out and they hung up on these rocks. Now they couldn't, they couldn't get them back up. They had to let them go down. They got rope. I don't know how much rope it took for them to, to they brought all kind of rope with them. And they let, let a couple of Japs down. And they'd go down there and tie, uh, tie a dead one or live one to this board and then they let them all the way down to the riverbed and it was either three to five hundred feet I know I could look down there and see the top of trees way down there and uh, so there was I was put in the hospital later I told them I said that, uh, and I'll never forget when uh, Wilson ahead of me he done gone around they didn't know it but when they got to that station where the gate was they they stopped, you know, and wait, wait for us. I mean, we don't show up. They turn around, they come looking for us. Well, they, they figured we just had a problem, you know, with the truck. And uh, so we didn't have any soldiers with them, just a, just a Jap sergeant that was in charge of the guards. And uh, when they, I heard them coming, and I done made up a good story. And I, I just wanted to live long enough to tell Wilson that we better get the hell out of here. And uh, so I'd made up a good story. And they stopped, and Wilson come running over to where I was. He said, Cajun, you heard bad? I said, Wilson, I'll tell you what. I said, we better get the hell out of here. I said, I'll run that bunch of mountains over here. <laughs> and uh, he said, we, 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 we can't do that. Well, see, I knew if, if they came back and I wasn't there, they'd kill him right there. They'd kill Wilson right there on the spot. There's only reason I came back down off, top, off that mountain. I done started climbing that mountain. And then I began tiring down and, and began thinking rationally again. But I'll never forget that sergeant that, uh, that came back with Wilson. And he didn't look at me. He, he went over to the side. He could see where the truck had gone over. He went over to the side, you know, and he looked and looked and looked. They, they had these caps, you know, with the flaps on the back of them. He look over here like that, and then he say, "Oh, I hate that son!" And he put put his hand up to his ear, and turn his head and listen. He did that about three times before he decided he wasn't going to get any answer. But uh, we we went on back to uh, to the town of uh, uh, Bontoc, where the hospital was, and they brought these they were bringing these Japs in for the next two days into the hospital. Well, the interpreter was one of them that was thrown out and hung on the, on the uh, rocks. And he was a third bed in that hospital from me. And they had two MPs, intelligence people, standing by him, sitting by that bed 24 hours a day. Well, the third day, he came to. And the first thing they asked him is if the American liberated run them over a cliff. And he told them no. But he didn't know because he and that Jap officer were sound asleep. <laughs> but see, this, uh, this interpreter was reared by, uh, from a, as an infant, a baby, by some missionaries in Japan and uh, some Christian missionaries. And they had educated him, sent him through school, sent him through college, 
and he was a sports writer for one of the big newspapers in Tokyo until they drafted him as an interpreter. And uh, that's the only thing I regretted about that was because I saw him several months later, and, and he would stare, had a blank stare, he'd look at you, but no recognition. And the other Japs told us that he was uh, uh, Baca, crazy. And uh, well, he would, he'd look at us and wouldn't recognize us and wouldn't talk. He didn't even talk to Japanese. He wouldn't talk to the Japs either. And this is a new group of Japs at headquarters because we had taken uh, the original Jap headquarters that was there when we went there to drive truck. We took them down to Manila and put them on ships, and they were going to the Solomon Islands. Well, you know what happened to Solomon Islands. <laughs> In fact, we were talking to the mess sergeant, the only one that came back through from that group. Came back, and he came through Baguio, Camp John Hay, and uh, he's, he's telling us, I like the old fellow. He must have been 45, 47 years of age, but to me, he was an old man, you know, just like I'm an old man. And to, to some of us, to Dr. Dunn over here. Uh, but, but he came into our room there in Baguio, and he was telling us about the ships that took them to, to the Solomon Islands. They never did, never did dock. They were attacked by American uh, uh, PT boats. And of course, the bombers sank the, sank the uh, ships too. And he said that all the soldiers died, you know, in, in, the, in the water. And uh, he said a few survived. He was a survivor. And uh, he told us all about that trip to Solomon and how they, they were all killed. But uh, the, uh, uh, this, Let's see. Where was I? Where was I when I got off on that? You would ask me something. Huh? Uh, you, you answered my question. Huh? You answered my question. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, after after this accident, and I, I got back to uh, to Baguio. Uh, the first thing is transportation officer uh, came in and talked to me and said, well, I don't suppose you want to, I suppose you'll be afraid to drive trucks now in the mountains. I said, what are you talking about? I said, we have accidents in America all the time. I said, accidents don't hurt anything. I said, no, I can drive a truck now just as good as I could before. But you see, this was a real speed wagon. And a real speed wagon had air booster brakes on it. And if your engine died, you had no brake. And so I told him I took my hand off, off of the steering wheel to, to shift gears to, to high to go down this incline. I said, the engine stopped. And I said, I couldn't stop. I couldn't brake it. But hey, I only had a foot and a half, two feet anyway. See? And uh, so that's what saved me, except uh, the, uh, this interpreter telling them, that no, I, I, I wasn't responsible for that. And for another 16 or 18 months, I might be down the lowland, some little barrio down there, and a Jap soldier would uh, accidentally come up and start talking, you know, and, and uh, uh, carrying on conversation, you know, and fine. I you know, did that a lot of times on these trips. But then the minute they mentioned something about accident, if I, in America, you ever have an accident in America or something, you know? So, man, I'd, I'd go the same route, same story, all the time. And it was 18 months later before the transportation officer called me up to his office and told me I'd been exonerated and no responsibility in the accident that I had. So I, I, I survived that. But, uh, when, when, uh, when we got, let's say it was in June, June of 1944, we had already destroyed most of our vehicles. We sabotaged them. I mean, we'd burn them up, uh, tear them up. And uh, we had one old international station, uh, international truck that uh, took us back to 
Kaban Tawan. That was a concentration camp. Now, we, this is the first time we had been in Kaban Tawan. We were in Camp O'Donnell, at the, the camp at the end of the death march when we went up into the mountains. But uh, we were there for, I don't know, three or four weeks and asked for volunteers to go to Japan. So we got together. Now, we knew what was going on with the fighting in the South Pacific. We knew that the Americans were coming on up, gradually island after island, and they were getting real close. And we decided that we better get as far away from the fighting as we could because uh, we, we figured the Japanese would kill us or they would try to get us out and the Americans would kill us, sink our boat, sink the ship. And uh, we, we left on July the 2nd uh, from Manila Bay and 62 days later we landed on Kyushu Island and we've been in a whole this ship, 621 men start, starting the trip for, for 62 days and hold this thing and they had the covers on it and uh, there again no, no uh, bathroom facilities and you're laying in your own field, the other's field and we got to Formosa uh, which is Taiwan now they run us out now we were in a hole just ahead of the, the bridge ship's bridge right above us and all this stink was going up <laughs> up to them too see. so when we got to Formosa they run us out on the dock naked and they turned the fire hose on salt water but they turned us over on it and of course that was great we did anything to get some of the crud off of us and they, they washed us down with, with a hose and then they, they washed the hole of the ship down and uh, pumped all that junk overboard but as we went back on, on board they gave each one of us a little green banana, it was a tiny thing about that long, you know, not as long as a, a wiener, and not much beer around in there. And uh, I, nobody threw any, anything away. It was peeling and all. We ate it all. And uh, because we got a five gallon bucket of rice a day and a five gallon uh, bucket of water a day for that many men in the whole of this ship. And uh, it, it just didn't stretch that far. Mo a lot of people never got a, got a taste of it. And uh, so we lost a lot of men on this, on this trip in that 62 days. And we shove them up on deck and they throw them overboard. So no, no telling how many, how many people been <laughs> we lost on, on that trip. Now I know a ship following us had 1,600 and some odd officers most of them were officers. They had some enlisted men. And uh, left Manila, and they were attacked just after they got outside of uh, the entrance to Manila Bay. The Navy attacked them with their airplane, dive bombers, and uh, they crippled the ship so bad that they, they run it aground. And uh, they, made the, they made the prisoners get off. Well, they got off, and they were supposed to you know, go to go to the shore, and but when, after they got off, somebody made a another decision, I guess, and and they started shooting the, these people in the water. Well, those that survived this shooting from the ship, getting to the shore, the Japs on the shore were shooting at them, and uh, so it, it was a madhouse before they got it to where some of the guys could get 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 up on on shore, and. Uh, but anyway, they, they lost a bunch of men there. Then they took uh, and put them on another ship up at San Fernando. They put them on another ship as the survivors. And this ship was attacked. And it was attacking to Cal Harbor and, and uh, Taiwan Harbor, Formosa Harbor. And uh, the, uh, it had a, a captain well, he, he was a captain then, but he, was, he retired a general. Uh, he was one of those that was on board. Now, uh, Chaplain Taylor wrote a book, and he told all about this. But out of, out of that 1,600 and some odd people on board, 
400 of them got to Japan. So the rest of them lost due to bombings and so forth board the ship. And uh, I was up there, like I say, until they asked for volunteers and we, we got out of there and any ship that came after us were uh, bombed and strafed by our own people because they didn't know that the American prisoners on board. And uh, that was a disgrace. The Japs could have saved themselves a lot of their own lives if they had just gone in and printed uh, American prisoners on board. And, and, uh, but they didn't do that. So the Japs, like on, on the uh, one that the Rocco Maru that Chaplain Taylor was on, uh, they had a lot of civilian men, women, and children on board that ship that's trying to take out keep them from getting picked out, caught by Americans. And uh, I'm trying to think of something else I might be able to tell you that, uh, oh, I can tell you one thing, that uh, it's kind of, uh, it's not ugly, it, it, it's terrible, it's horrible. But going into this town where this guy, these guys hit me with a club, Go, going in there, there, there was, was a fence. There's some little uh, houses over here, and a fence there, and a, a gate here to go into the house. And there was a Filipino woman laying on the ground, and her intestines were stretched out on the on the fence, and she was still alive. She had tried to give some food to some of the prisoners, and the Japs cut her open, and strung an entrance out on the fence. That was a horrible thing. But they did a lot of horrible things. And i tell you something else. I, I've forgiven every one of those Japs that ever beat me, ever called me any trouble whatsoever. But uh, I'm not going to let them out of my sight. I'm not going to turn my back on them in this country or anywhere else. That's just, just the way it is. You, you forgive those, but I can, don't trust the others. No. Our period's about over, Colonel. Uh, does anybody have any quick questions they'd like to ask Colonel O'Shea before we adjourn? Well, I wish the lab was long, but we only have two hours. A lot of my students have classes they have to go to, so... We thank you to come for coming, and we'd like to invite you back again some other time. You, I, I haven't told you a lot of things that happened. <laughs> but by, by the way, I did write a book, and uh, I do have books. I carry them with me in the car all the time because people always want them. And it was a bestseller with the bookstore and uh, the mall for quite a few months. And, uh, but I do carry, carry them in the back of my car. If anybody wants one, they're ten dollars, and uh, be be happy to sell one day to you. It'd be something to remember. Well, thank y'all. Y'all have been real attentive, and I certainly appreciate that. And I hope you enjoyed what I've said. And uh, maybe I'll see you again sometime. So.